All right. Well, hello. I am here with uh, talking with Lexi Levine, uh, Joanne's daughter, and Barry's one of Barry's three sisters. Hi, Lexi. Hello. How are you? Very well, thank you. So it's um, National Sibling Month, and we're using this as an excuse to talk to the siblings of uh, a lot of the kids that have been part of, whose families have been part of Courageous Parents Network. Um, and as you know, we had a fabulous time in conversation with your mother, Joanne, and Barry's palliative care doctor, Julie Hauer. And all the way through, you and your sister, mm -hmm. you and your sisters kept coming up in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a really a beautiful thing that we can finally talk to you. And so I'm not going to hand it over to you. If you could just say a little bit about, um, you know, introduce yourself, where you were, are in the birth order. And then, you know what? Actually just start talking about Barry. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm the youngest of three sisters. So we have Kristen, who is now 33, I think. I always forget. Um, and she's a mom and she's married. And then we have Brooke, who is 24 and she's engaged. And then we have me, who is a senior at Assumption College. Um, and then when I was two, we brought home a little Barry. So first of all, I had a little resentment to this new baby because I had been the center of its attention. I was the youngest, the cutest, my sisters made over me, everyone made over me. I loved attention. And so then once this new little baby came home, I wasn't sure how I felt about him because he was naturally trying to take my center of attention. Um, and so when we, when Barry first came home, we thought we had a normal baby brother and we loved him and treated him just like every other baby brother. My best friend growing up actually had, um, a brother the same age. So we were going through this struggle together unknowingly, of course, only at two years old. Um, and so then pretty quickly we realized, um, Barry wasn't quite normal and I still didn't really understand what any of that meant. Um, I knew he got a cold that the rest of us had. Um, Brooke had brought it home from preschool, and um, I could see that we we felt better in a couple weeks, and Barry didn't. And um, we still, I still didn't know what that meant. But after going to a lot of doctors and him still getting worse, um, finally we realized that there was something really wrong. And so me only being two at the time, not going to school, not going to daycare, I was dragged along to all these appointments. So I used to hear big words like globally disabled and uh, let's see, so, um, macrocephaly and visually impaired. And I didn't know what any of this meant, but I did know that I was always used as the healthy control because whenever anything new came up with Barry, they wanted to see, since I was at all the appointments, see if I had it too. So I can remember from a little age, them measuring Barry's head and then measuring my head and realizing that we both had huge heads. So maybe that was a little bit more genetic than some sort of connection to his, um, his troubles. So um, his first year of life was pretty, pretty tricky just because um, we didn't really know what the future held. And anytime us, our little germy hands got near him, it ran the risk of him getting pretty sick. Um, so I think that I still thought he was normal because um, if I look back at pictures, I see me um, holding his head up because he couldn't do it himself. And then you see me with other babies and I was holding their heads up too because I just figured they couldn't do it either. Um, so for a long time, I thought that my baby brother was just like everybody else's baby brother and any troubles he faced, everybody else must have been facing as well. Um, so then quickly, the uh, any sort of resentment I felt to this new little baby faded, faded away. Um, because I was the youngest and I had four year gap with Brooke and then a 12 year gap with Kristen, a lot of times no one wanted to play with me. So now that I was an older sister, I felt like I could have this little sibling who would always love to play with his cool big sister. So, um, still I think that we played in different ways, but I didn't think anything different of it. There um, are lots of pictures of me just kind of laying on the floor with him and babbling away and creating these imaginary stories that we did, that didn't require him to move in ways he couldn't or didn't require him to talk. Um, and then I'm trying to think of the first time I actually 
realized that something was wrong. I think it was when Brooke was in the third grade. So I must have been like five, Barry must have been like three. Um, Brooke had some activity at school and all the siblings and parents were invited. So we all went and, and um, even seeing other healthy siblings, I still didn't really realize anything was wrong until one other student made a comment about how Barry was different. And that kind of just sparked it for me that um, something wasn't right. Like not every little kid, I realized myself, like I wasn't going to the doctor every week and I didn't uh, like suffer from colds for and weeks on end. Um, so that kind of made me realize that he was pretty different. Um, so I think then I started asking a lot of questions. I started asking questions to my mom. And then when we would go to the doctors, I would ask more questions. And um, as I got older, the questions got a little bit more sophisticated. And I got really involved in Barry's care. And I love science. So I always have and hopefully always will. So um, anytime I would learn about a new aspect of Barry's care, as I would start to get older, I would research it and research some new treatments and then go to the doctors and ask, well, why aren't we doing this? What, what does this mean for Barry, like in relation to all these other problems and that kind of thing. So um, I was really involved in his care, but also Barry was my best friend. Um, I didn't know many siblings, boy, girl siblings who were two years apart who could lay on the couch and just sing all day together without wanting to kill each other. Um, so that was different, but in the best possible way. Um, we were close in a way that no other boy, girl sibling I know of were close. Um, I told Barry everything and he had to be sworn to secrecy because he couldn't talk. So that came in handy, I would say. Um, and you know, it was, I always was amazed that um, he was facing all these problems, but he could always make me feel better. Like my senior year in high school, I went through kind of a rough time with a relationship and I couldn't really talk about it. I was really upset all the time. Didn't want my mom to hear, but when we would go to Seven Hills, I would just kind of think about it in my head. And when I would lay with him, it just felt like he was telling me like he understood, like he just would put his hands somewhere on me and just kind of, somehow calm me down in a way that I really can't explain. And a lot of people would say to me like, well, how are you close if you can't talk? Like, what do you do together? And I said, I, I don't know, you just, you just have to see it. Like anyone who saw us together knew that we shared this bond that I don't even know if my other sisters had with him. It was just something like that we could just be in each other's presence and just feel that it was gonna be okay. And I think that that might be why I was always hopeful, even when my scientific mind kind of knew otherwise and my family and the doctors worried that it was too much optimism. I just felt like I kind of knew when Barry was going to be okay and when he wasn't. And um, I, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 just keep going. You're okay. good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, let's see if there's anything else I want to cover. Um, I think it was like a two-way street though. Barry could calm me down, but I could also calm him down. Like when I would get to the hospital and he was in a crisis and had tubes coming out of every area in his body, I would somehow crawl through all the wires and get as close as I could to him. And like, all it really took was for me to put on some soft rock, as I like to call it, and sing quietly and just rub his tummy as he loved. And just when I thought he would be asleep and I would stop rubbing his tummy, he would, his hand would always be on top of mine whenever I was doing it. And as soon as I would stop, he would push my hand to tell me to keep going. Um, and they used to call that the sister test because if I was getting to bed and he wasn't getting better or he didn't perk up even a little bit, then they were in trouble. Um, there were only a few times that happened and those were the times that I was worried. Um, so yeah, I think that sums, sums it up pretty well. So beautiful. <laughs> Thank so you. Beautiful. What an extraordinary relationship to to have. I'm sorry. Um, so, do you, I know that? Well, can you say how long ago? How old were you when Barry died? How long ago was that? So I was 19. I was a freshman in college. Um, 
so I was at Assumption and Brooke, my middle sister, was at Holy Cross, but both in Worcester, only 15 minutes away. And I, I was really thankful for the circumstances of the situation because we were from a really small town. And I think that if I was still in high school, it would have made it so much worse because even though I go to a small college, I could go places and people wouldn't still wouldn't know me or not know me well enough to know what I went through. So I could pretend like everything was okay sometimes. And also the fact that Brooke were still so close, we could pick each other up and go to Seven Hills where Barry was living together. And um, we spent a lot of time together. I mean, we were, me and Brooke are very, very close already, but I think that just brought us closer because we would just sit in silence on the 45 minute drive to Seven Hills there. And then we'd stay with Barry for as long as we could handle it. And then we would both be sniffling on the 45 minutes back and just, hug each other goodbye and you know we didn't really have to say anything we both kind of um at first we didn't I I didn't I can't speak for her I didn't know how bad it was because when I first saw Barry um I thought to myself I'd seen him worse before honestly because right now it just seemed like he was sleeping a lot so I kind of figured it was like a drug imbalance sort of thing my mom kind of didn't tell me all the details so I didn't really realize how bad the situation was at first. Um, I think when I realized it, it was about a week before he passed away. And I think it was mine and Brooke's last visit together. Um, and his nurse from his old school was there. And I realized that he hadn't been getting any feeds. And so I said to her, um, how long can he go without eating? And she told me, um, not very much longer. So I knew then that it wasn't good. And um, they said that they weren't going to restart the feed. So I really knew that our time together was limited. So um, this was, I think, the week before mine and Brooke's spring break. We had the same spring break. Um, and she was supposed to go somewhere tropical. And um, she kind of went back and forth, like, should I go? Should I not? And my mom wanted it to be her decision. And also, we had been in this situation before. Like, we, there were times where we had changed plans because we thought it might be the end, and then Barry was fine. So I think in her mind, she thought she would go, and she would have fun, and then she'd be back still and be able to see Barry. And my mom, like I said, my mom wanted it to be her decision, but when she asked me what I would do, I said I wouldn't go. But that was just me. And at first I was a little upset that she still wanted to go because I worried, I worried that she would never see him again and then worry, and then be mad that we let her go and that kind of thing. Um, but I my mom said everybody handles it a different way and that we need to respect her decision. And that was how she was dealing with it. So she went and, um, then we, so let's see, I think that was like a Saturday or Sunday she left. And then there were like a span of three or four days of the spring break that my mom and I just went to seven Hills all day, every day. And, um, it, you knew it was bad when, um, off duty nurses were coming in to see Barry, um, that um, they were coming to say goodbye. And um, I remember thinking, like, how can we just end this for him? Like, um, I had never really seen him in pain like this before. Um, that wasn't caused by something understandable like when he had his spinal fusion of course he was groaning a lot he was in pain he just had two huge rods nailed into his spine so that was a little understandable um but in this instance he hadn't had a surgery he hadn't been seizing and he was grimacing and moaning every time he took a breath and i was trying to figure out some way to either save him or the opposite take away the pain somehow and um I had always taken the standpoint that I wanted Barry to be here the, as long as possible my mom always said comfort over or uh quality over quantity but 
I really wanted the best of both worlds. And I think sometimes I lean toward quantity. I really wanted him to be here to see um, me get my white coat. I wanted him to be at my white coat ceremony so bad. <laughs> um, and in these last couple of days, I realized that um, I couldn't ask him to do anything else for me. He had really shaped me into who I was um, as a person. He had te taught me so much more than any 19 year old knew about pain and suffering, empathy, pretty much anything you name it. Um, and he had given me so much insight to what I wanted to do with my life and um, so much happiness. And I realized at that moment, I could not ask him to do another thing for me. So, um, I asked Dr. Hauer, um, I said, how do we speed this up? How do we take away his pain? And um, at this time, the only thing, the only kind of uh, support he had was oxygen. And she said, we can shut the oxygen off. And um, this part I really don't talk about because I feel sometimes like, well, what would have happened if I hadn't asked to shut that off? But I also know that um, I helped him in that moment, but I think that it's it's a very fine balance and it's really hard to think about. And as a 19 year old, I don't, I think that that was a really hard thing for me to even ask. And I think that I made the right choice, um, but I think that's the main thing I question in Barry's life, whether that was the right thing to do. Um, but I think I'm still glad that I did it because um, even if he had survived through that week, I don't think he could have recovered from that quite the quite in the way he had recovered times before. Um, yeah. And I think one other detail I forgot to mention was, um, so after Brooke and I went to Seven Hills the last time um, together, at that point, we, this was before spring break, um, she had decided it had gotten too much for her to go every single day. And as I luckily had been granted permission because um, freshmen usually can't have their cars at college and, and um, they had given me permission in the summer before the year started to have my car so I could go and see Barry whenever I wanted. And um, so I, let's see, I think it was a Tuesday because I had genetics lab and um, we were we were working on fruit flies, and I remember my partner was not holding up her end of the bargain, so I had to spend like two extra hours counting these stupid fruit flies, and all I wanted to do was get to Seven Hills and spend some time with my brother, and at this point, I hadn't, I hadn't told many people what was going on, and I, I think that's really because I didn't know, and um, my roommate knew because she came in... Um, right after when I got off the phone with my mom once and I really figured it out and then she told our other two best friends so they kind of were the only people at school that knew and then I I had an uh like a chorus rehearsal that evening so I couldn't get in touch with the professor so finally I just went and found her and, and I knew I needed to skip it because I needed to get to Barry so um she was kind of a abrasive woman and so I caught her in passing. I was like, oh, Professor Gravelin. And she's like, what is it? I'm, in a, I'm late. I was like, oh, um, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be able to come to rehearsal today. And she was like, well, why not? And my eyes just filled up with tears. And I was like, my brother's really sick. I need to go see with him. And in that moment, she was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Like, I didn't realize. And so um, in, that, in that moment, I realized how it was this weird Thing I was going through like the world was still turning like everyone was still living their lives everyone thought I was living my life normally but um I had this big weight on my shoulders that no one really knew about and um on the way to Seven Hills it was a long drive especially when I was by myself I was racking my brain trying to think of all the things that Barry loved and in what I could do to make his um, last couple of days better. And I just wanted one way to show him how much I loved him and make him happy in some way. So I remembered that um, when he was little, he loved creamsicles. So until he was about 10, he could eat by mouth. And he loved orange, he, we used to use orange flavored toothpaste, anything orange he loved. And um, like to the point where if one of the sisters had a popsicle, he would grab our arm and take us 
big as a bite as he could possibly. Then we'd have to fish it out so he wouldn't choke on such a big bite um, just so he could get his taste. But so, so on my way to Seven Hills, I remembered these moments when we used to all fall over laughing when he would steal our popsicles. So I decided that I was going to go to um, the supermarket and get a box of creamsicles and give him a creamsicle. And I knew that this was going to cause a lot of turmoil because Barry wasn't supposed to be eating by mouth and everybody would be worried that he would choke or whatever. But at this point, I knew that um, there really wasn't gonna be anything that could make him worse or better. So I thought there was no harm in this. So I bought the whole box of creamsicles. I get to Seven Hills and I, I, these popsicles are melting. So I need to hurry this process up. So I'm trying to time it just right so I can do it right after a nurse leaves. So I'll have like five minutes before they come back. And um, I didn't time it right. So I, a nurse walked in and kind of just looked at me. The nurses at Seven Hills pretty much knew I was running the show and <laughs> didn't really question anything I ever did with my brother which was appreciated, but also my fault because of my attitude towards them. Um, and he just, and the nurse kind of just looked at me like, is everything okay? And I was like, don't tell my mom, Barry wanted a cream skull. So um, I gave, I put the cream skull up to his lips and um, made sure he was tasting it with his tongue. And in that moment when I was trying to do this one last nice thing for Barry, in his sleepy state, he perked up and gave me one last smile and still was giving more to me than I could ask for. Um, and I think that that was the last smile I ever got from Barry. Um, and I was so glad I had gotten those darn creamsicles and temporarily made everyone worried and upset. My sisters were freaking out at me because I was taking pictures, sending them, and they were like, and they were worried he was going to choke. And I was like, forget it. He already smiled. Like, you know, I, I did the right thing. <laughs> I, I, I think you did the right thing every step of the way until that very last moment too with the oxygen, because it came from such a place of extraordinary love, Lexi, and also you knew Barry, no one knew Barry better than you. So there's always a final moment. There's always an oxygen moment in, in some way, shape or form. Every, that's, that's true for everyone. And um, when it comes from a place of love, it's, I, don't, I personally don't believe there's ever a wrong, it's ever wrong. Um, uh, can, can, uh, I've, you have you moved me so much. Uh, can we go back for a minute to helping, like, as you said, you were kind of running the show. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit because your mother and Julie talk about this, about how you first felt when your mother said, you know, I can't take care of Barry anymore at home. It's time to, for him to live full time at Seven Hills. And then, so that, what you remember feeling and thinking then, and then also, which may or may not be related, um, whether you were upset when you found out that they had stopped feeds. Like, you know, obviously it's a, a long period later, um, but do you remember thinking like, in both of those moments, how, how, it, how you processed all of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the first question requires a bit of a longer answer. So um, when I was a junior in high school, so I must have been like 16, um, Barry had been in and out of the hospital f like all, my, all fall of my junior year. And I was pretty much living at the house by myself because Bear, uh, my mom always stayed with Barry when he was in the hospital and Brooke was at college. Kristen was living in Philadelphia. Um, so I would go to school, get up extra early to take care of the dog, go to my morning meetings, go to school, go to soccer practice, and then come home, try to make dinner as someone who couldn't cook. And then on the weekends, I would go and see Barry. And um, it was this long period of time where he was in the hospital. And like, sometimes it just felt like the doctors weren't doing anything. And that was a big cause of frustration because he would like, he was in the hospital for so long. And it was like, they were just observing him basically. And I can remember even saying like, you're just waiting for him to seize again because you want to see what will happen. And maybe that will give you some information, but I'm not sure how that would help you figure out a treatment plan. And 
And so it was really frustrating because I kind of felt like the doctors were giving up on Barry a little bit, but um, I wasn't, and I had hoped my other family wasn't. So um, then once the holidays came around, um, Barry got a lot worse, and we we spent Thanksgiving and then spent Christmas in the hospital, and then um, it was between Christmas and New Year's where um, Barry had coded and his oxygen went down really low, and they had to emergency intubate him, and my mom was there alone, and I'm sure that was a horrible tra traumatic scene for her. Um, and but we had been there before; this had happened, and. Um, not that it was normal, just that it could be worse, I think, and it had happened before and he had gotten better. So I wasn't extremely concerned at that. And, but everybody else was. So then they decided, I think the first meeting we had was with the PAC team at Children's and um, That's it was the palliative the, care team. Yes, the palliative yeah. care team. So um, Dr. Howard wasn't a part of this meeting. It was these two doctors I had never met before. I think one might have been some sort of like psychologist, psychiatrist thing as a support to the family. But I remember them telling me how sick Barry was. And I was really confused because I remember that they didn't know Barry. Like it wasn't like they had been involved in his care all his life. So I felt like they were speaking to things they couldn't speak to. And they were trying to, like, explain my brother to me. And, and it was a really confusing meeting. I wasn't sure why I was there. And then finally, the truth came out. The reason we were there was because my mom had decided to sign a DNR. And that uh, meant that in the case that Barry had, uh, I was to code again, that they would not um, perform life-saving measures. And um, I actually had kind of forgotten this detail until I saw the interviews with my mom and, and um, it brought back a lot of memories for me. But I guess in that moment, I, I remember now saying it, I um, told them that they were going to kill my brother because if he coded and they didn't save him, he was going to die. And in that moment, the, the reason I said that was because we had seen him come back from these situations so many times and eventually reach his baseline again. So I didn't feel like this; these acute episodes would be enough to let him go, you know? Um, so I was pretty upset by that meeting. And then um, a couple of weeks, I think, so that was, might have been before, no, that was after he coded. And then um, still not a lot of progress was going on. So we decided to have a team meeting. So all of his lifelong doctors that I trusted a whole lot more and knew more, um, came to this meeting where with um, me my mom and Brooke and then my sister was conference called and Kristen was conference called in and there were tons of people who really didn't need to be there that were there who just kind of cared for Barry like various nurses and that kind of thing and um, so first they kind of did like a check-in with like each specialty and in each specialty kind of said like their standpoint and I remember this his neurologist who I really always admired and he he said like Barry had has certainly regressed and those words just kind of stuck with me because I felt like maybe he had a little bit but it wasn't permanent like I knew he could get better again and um so that that was a blow to my uh ego I guess or my opinion um and basically so by the end of the did you believe, did you suddenly go, oh, he has, or they're wrong? Um, a little bit of both. So I kind of felt like they said that because, yeah, if you looked at him lying in the hospital bed right now, it wasn't good. But what I believed was that once he got better from this acute episode, he would be able to reach his baseline again. Like he would not suddenly forget how to pull himself up into the sitting position and that kind of thing, those goals he had accomplished. Um, and so I felt like they weren't seeing the full picture and not seeing beyond just what their eyes were seeing. And they needed to think bigger picture with Barry because not always everything with Barry was bigger picture. Like you couldn't just look at his neurology standpoint because it was always related to his lungs or whatever other body part was troubling him at the moment. Um, and so by the end of this meeting, basically it was, where do we go from here? 
So I jumped in and I kind of said, well, I've heard of all these new treatments and why don't we try one of them? And um, no, 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 the berry's not a candidate. No, no, no. And um, so I was like, okay, so if I'm the only one proposing treatments here, then what are we going to do? Like, aren't you guys the ones who are supposed to tell me how you're going to fix my brother? And um, basically, not in so many words, it was, we can't fix your brother. So when these doctors gave up on Barry, it was a whole lot worse than when the pack team gave up on Barry. Um, they had followed him since little and they had seen him bounce back and I knew this was bad. So then my mom, when, when the question was posed, like, what do we do next? My mom talked about Seven Hills and how she would be comfortable moving him there. At first, it, it was supposed to be a respite. Um, and then when she said that, it was like a light bulb went off and all the doctors said, oh, that's a great idea. Yes, let's do that. Both my sisters jumped on the bandwagon. They thought it was a great idea. And in this whole packed room, I was the only person who did not want Barry to go to Seven Hills. My, I, I remembered, um, it was kind of noisy. Everybody thought this was a great idea. And I just kind of cleared my throat and the room went silent. And um, I said, my voice was shaking. I was trying so hard to keep it together in front of these, my potentially future colleagues. And um, I said, you don't know my brother. Every time you doubt him, he will prove you wrong. And that was just kind of it. The meeting just kind of ended. People started to leave and it was decided Barry was going to Seven Hills. So that was, I think, in January of my junior year of high school. And um, I was really mad about it. I was mad that um, my mom didn't think she could take care of him anymore. Um, I thought in my brain, like, well, what if something happened to me? Like, you would take care of me and you wouldn't, send me away like um I just I just really couldn't understand why my mom would do it I I couldn't understand why everybody at Seven Hills wasn't up to my 100% standard of excellence um I mean generally yes Seven Hills is an excellent place but if I ever saw one flaw whenever I saw one flaw I generalized it to the whole staff um and I was just really upset so that I took that out on my mom. I took that out on the staff at Seven Hills. And it, I, I couldn't really explain it, though. I was feeling all this anger and sadness. And um, the way I handled it was I just kind of, I avoided being home with my mom because it was just me and her at this point. Since Brooke was at school, Kristen was out of the house, and now Barry was at Seven Hills. And I really just didn't want to just be there with her. Um, at first. So I would go to Seven Hills a lot. I would go by myself and I really needed to be with Barry by myself, I think. Um, and I remember the first time I went there, I was mad because he was um, put into a room with a girl and that is not standard procedure. And um, I right off the bat, I was like, well, why are, are you treating my brother differently? And they were just like, oh, well, just waiting for his room like someone is staying a respite and then it'll transition to his permanent room and then you know I just started finding things off the bat that I didn't like and so I knew that I needed to lay down the law <laughs> and first um we my mom also agreed that they she wanted them to know like what was we normally did like what kind of routine we had so we did together like write up a little protocol type thing of like um, what we, like a normal routine and then also exceptions. Like Barry had a body jacket for his, um, um, his scoliosis and that he hated that thing. So like we kind of were under the protocol that if he wasn't feeling well, he didn't need to wear the body jacket. And like, we, we didn't never wore it on him at home. It was just for like school. And, um, at Seven Hills, when they saw a body jacket, they like required it all the time. And so, in my mind, if Barry wasn't, if Barry was sick enough not to go to school, then he did not need that body jacket on. So I would, at first, I would just come in and just take it off myself. And the nurses would come in and say, oh, why is Barry's body jacket on and off? And I would say, why does it need to be on? He's lying in bed. This is supposed to be a relaxing time. And um, so, like, slowly they started to listen to me and we, they relaxed about the body jacket a bit. And then 
other things like um, we always like Barry to look his best and we um, were really vigilant about his care that was related to his appearance like my mom would torture him and wash his face and shave his face and he hated it but we wanted him to look just like the other sisters and my mom would never let us go out of the, ha the house if our hair was a mess so he wasn't allowed to either so um, when I realized like the CNAs didn't necessarily meet my standard of care for Barry, just because maybe the other patients' families didn't express as much concern about that. I had to write some protocol about that, that Barry's face was to be washed every single morning and every single night because his acne was out of control and um, that wasn't fair to him. Like if I was in a bed, I would hope someone would make sure I didn't have pimples all over my face. Um, it was, so it was little things like that, that I, if Barry was going to be at this place, then he was going to get my standard of treatment and he was going to get the kind of treatment he got at home. So um, I think I started to warm up to Seven Hills probably through the nurses. Um, I had more problems with the CNAs just because they, it was more relaxed in the sense that like their uh, protocols weren't as strict. Like sometimes Barry was left like in a wet diaper for a long time and I didn't like that and I didn't think that was fair and that would never fly at home. So um, the nurses knew the most about Barry and um, had the most background, like medical knowledge, and also would go out of their way to care for Barry. And like, that was maybe the CNA's responsibility, um, like in terms of comfort and like appearance sort of things. So um, I would mostly talk to them about where Barry was at in his care and how things were going and what they saw for the future. And um, it was kind of a weird dynamic at first because I think that the nurses knew how um, hopeful I was. So sometimes they would play into it and kind of tell me like, oh, like, yeah, we think Barry is starting to turn a corner or whatever. But then if I would talk to my mom, she would not share any of those same beliefs. So I wasn't really sure if they were just trying to appease me or they just really weren't on the same page or what was going on. So. Um, I think that I was iffy still about Dr. Howard because I figured that with this disconnect between my mom and the nurses, maybe it was coming from Dr. Howard. Maybe my mom was hearing a different story from Dr. Howard and Dr. Howard wasn't there with Barry as much as the nurses were. So they saw things that she didn't. So I, I, did, I was trying to figure out the cause of this problem. And then like when Dr. Howard would come around and I would be there, like she would give a lot of like general assessments of Barry and I don't know, like not really propose anything new. And I felt like things needed to change in order to help him progress um, and get better. And it was just kind of like, she just wanted to keep him stable, which is fine. And I think my mom did too, instead of worrying about getting him better to where he was before and like progressing in his school and physical therapy and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that Dr. Howard was working from that standpoint because that's what my mom had expressed she wanted, but that's not what I wanted. <laughs> um, so I remember that, um, so as junior year was wrapping up, I was looking at senior year. So there were a lot of things to come, like my senior pictures and my graduation and all that stuff. And I wanted Barry to be included. So basically since we were little, like Barry was always, he had to do whatever the sisters had to do. So he would come to our Saturday morning soccer games and cheer us on. And like, whenever we didn't want to have to do something, he probably didn't either, but he had to just like we did. We never treated him like just because he's in a wheelchair or disabled, he can just stay at home and watch cartoons. Like, no, he was coming to everything as for as long as he could. And I didn't want that to change. And I knew that um, like, it wasn't fair for could be in my senior pictures. Like I was in hers. Um, and Barry couldn't. So I told my mom that I would not be taking senior pictures unless Barry would be in them. And so um, luckily we found a photographer who was willing to go all the way out to Groton and um, Seven Hills had a nice um, campus, I guess you would call it. So we did um, take these beautiful pictures and this was the first day that was like some sort of miracle. Like Barry hadn't been having a great week up till then. And then on that day, he was weirdly all smiles and healthy and fine to get out of bed and go take some pictures. 
so I didn't really notice it yet that like miracle type day. But then, um, after the senior pictures hurdle, I, it was that Barry was coming to my graduation and all the, I had talked to nurses who had told me like, Oh yeah, no problem. We take kids out all the time to family events. Like I, his, um, neighbor had just gone to his brother's wedding and I was like, perfect. Then like, let's start planning. It was only in the fall of my senior year at this point. So we had all the way until June. And I knew my mom really didn't want Barry to come to the graduation because she was worried that something would happen and it would ruin the day. But I didn't really realize that portion at first. I just heard her say no, which I didn't like. And the nurses had already told me it would be no problem. So I don't know why she thought it would be a problem. So um, I remember it was around Christmas time. And for Christmas, I made Barry like a graduation survival kit and like I wrote him this letter about like how he was going to come to my graduation and in the in the present was like the outfit I wanted him to wear and it was like a fan so he wouldn't get too hot and like a little stuffed bear with a graduation cap and gown and um so like my my whole family was there at Christmas and they kind of like all were looking at each other like she doesn't really get that he's not gonna come to graduation and I knew they were giving each other those looks, but I also knew that Barry was going to be there. <laughs> so um, what I didn't know was there was a lot of behind the scene works and really behind my back works of my mom with the nurses and Dr. Howard trying to figure out if there was any way this could be possible. So I think it was, it was approaching pretty like quick, pretty close to my graduation date when they finally said, here's the compromise. Barry can come home the day of graduation to the house and be in the pictures, and but he can't come to the school for graduation. It was too hot and too much noise and that kind of thing. And fine, that I was happy with that. He would at least be a part of the celebration. So um, I remember that when I saw that Seven Hills band coming down the street, like it was such a weird moment, like that someone was bringing Barry home which was like, I, I wish that hadn't had, hadn't had to happen. Like, it was really weird that he was, it was a reminder that he wasn't living at the house. And um, so he had come in just like a, a nice but regular outfit and they had brought the outfit I got him. And he was already, this was miracle day number two. He was having such a great day. He was smiling, getting down off the bus. And so it's like, let's not risk it. Let's not change his outfit. He looks fine. Like, Let's just take the pictures. So um, he used to not like to cooperate in pictures. Like, I think that was his rebellion, his type of rebellion he could uh, conquer. So at first he wasn't smiling, and then I knew what would get him to smile. So I got down, like, on my knees on the ground. So I was down to his vision level, and, of course, he started smiling, really because he could just get his hands in my hair at that point because he loved to mess up my hair. Um, he thought that was very funny. And so then he started smiling for all the pictures and my mom and sis and Brooke got in the pictures. Kristen was actually having a baby at this point. So she was not, not there. Um, and so it was just a great day. And like, I remember my little dog loved Barry and Barry did not love her back. The feeling was not mutual, but, um, I remember him coming in the house and she, like, there was a couch right next to where you walked into our house and she jumped up on it and practically leaped into his lap and was kissing his face. And he was just like, great. I didn't miss you. Uh, but they had seen each other. We used to bring him to, bring the dog to seven Hills. Um, and so, yeah, he had a great day and then it was about time to go to the high school for my graduation. So we said goodbye, which was really tough because again, a reminder that he wasn't living at home and that he had to go back to his home. Um, that wasn't mine. So that was pretty tough. Um, but I just kept reminding myself, like, this was so great that he was here. So in that moment, my liking for seven hills also increased because um they made this possible and like i would have had a significantly worse day if barry had not come home in the morning so i started to realize like okay i gotta be like nicer to the seven hills staff <laughs> um and by this point too like my mom and i's relationship had pretty pretty much improved too um i think really the only times we would kind of butt heads was if we were at seven hills and there was any sort of um, type of change that needed to be in his care, we would usually butt heads on 
on our opinions. Um, just because, like I said, she was more quality over quantity and just wanted to keep him stable while I wanted you, I want him to get better. And, um, so then I graduate high school, I go to college and when Barry was younger, he had gotten a make a wish and he got it when he was like fairly healthy, like for his standpoint. So, um, we, at first I was like, let's go to Disney world because that's what everybody does for a make a wish. And Barry had really never gotten to travel and he he loved swimming and loved the beach, so he would have got to do those both things. Um, but my mom was like, N we're not bringing that boy on a plane. Like, she absolutely axed it immediately. So then we were trying to think of other things we could do, and we were thinking, like, um, something to do, maybe make over his room, because he was still at home at this point. But then the process kind of stood still for a while, and we really didn't hear from him until, um, I think maybe that same year, the Make-A-Wish people just out of the blue contacted us again and said, let's get this done. Like, let's make his wish. And so um, by this point, we had all developed a love for country music because of Barry. So he had brought home a mixed tape of his teacher's favorite country songs. And she was like, and the teacher had written a note, play track two for Barry, and he will show you that he loves country music. And we're like, all right you're crazy. We actually love this teacher very much. Like we stay in touch with her to this day. And, um, and she was right because we played country girls shake it for me by Luke Bryan and Barry went crazy. So then I first, it was first me that started to like country music because of Barry. So I learned a few more songs and would play a lot more. And then, um, and then my mom kind of got warmed up to it and then Brooke kind of got warmed up to it. And actually last weekend I was in Philadelphia visiting Kristen and she says to me, Lexi, I don't want you to take the credit for this, but I pretty much only listen to country music now. And I was like, Hmm, <laughs> I was like, oh, what do you know? <laughs> and so, um, we all started listening to country music because of Barry. And so finally, now that he was at Southern Hills, we weren't going to redo his room. We knew we couldn't travel. So we said, we want a country singer to come sing to him. And at first we were proposing all the big names. Like Luke Bryan was the first one because we had seen how much Barry loved him. And then, or Carrie Underwood, like he loved her music too. And we were proposing the biggest stars really. And it was really hard to get those kinds of people. And so um, then the Make-A-Wish people had proposed a few like smaller names in country um, that we could like decide between. And so, and that, that would be willing to come to Seven Hills. So we decided on Lee Bryce. And at the time he wasn't huge in country music, only had a couple songs out, but now he's a lot bigger. Um, and so we, we book it. It was going to be in January and um, we were all so excited counting on the days. This day was going to be all about Barry in a positive way, which was virtually impossible never happened really um usually when the situation was all about Barry it was because something bad was happening so um this I don't know if you remember but like four winters ago it was the worst winter ever and Brooke and I were in Worcester which was the snowiest city in Massachusetts and like had a record of like 97 inches in like a month or something and of course it was supposed to have a blizzard the weekend we were supposed to do it so my mom starts calling us. We got to call it off. Like, we can't travel, blah, 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 all this stuff. I was like, I said to her, Mom, if you cancel this, it will never happen. It's taken all these years to get this far. And if we don't do it, we never will. And so she was like, all right, let me talk to the Make-A-Wish person and I'll call you back. So I think the Make-A-Wish person agreed with me because she said, don't worry, we're going to send an SUV to Ashland to pick you up and bring you to Groton. And then we're going to send one to Worcester to pick Brooke and Lexi up and they're going to come to Groton. And then, um, so they do, we get to Groton in the day of, and then all of a sudden this huge Mercedes SUV pulls up right outside Bear's window, perfectly faced like the entrance. And um, we knew it was Lee Bryce. So we all get so excited. And this was actually miracle day number three because Barry was having a great day. I was listening to his music in anticipation and laughing and smiling. And um, so we're all getting like nervous. We're all starstruck. And so then 
he comes in and he is just the nicest human down to earth. And we go downstairs to like the classrooms and to have a nice like open area. And he just starts singing and Barry's face is so happy. And he's, he has this little toy tambourine he's shaking along and he's just having a great day. And then towards the end when we were starting to take pictures, um, Lee Bryce had this big like chain necklace on and we knew that Barry loved to yank on things like that. And so when he leaned over to take a photo with Barry, Barry grabbed the necklace and <laughs> to see it closer. And right away we're like, oh, no, and try to get Barry to let it go. And he's like, oh my God, it's fine. And he like takes it off and lets him see it closer. And we were just so taken aback by this, we call him a gentle giant because he was very big. Um, like humility and just treating Barry like a regular human, how we always wanted him to be treated. And it was just a great day. And actually, um, like about a week later, um, Barry gets a package in the mail at our house. And it's this beautiful, nice tambourine that's signed by Lee Bryce. And the note said that it was from his manager, who we also met and he said that um, Lee decided that Barry's baby toy tambourine wasn't nice enough for him to play like and he wanted him to have a real tambourine so he continued to be like this this superstar and he posted Barry all over social media so now Barry was famous and it was just amazing we were like over the moon that this happened so um that was yes like I said that was miracle day number three and um unfortunately that was the last miracle day because um unbeknownst to me um that same day when my mom first my mom beat us to seven hills a little bit um when he was getting dressed they couldn't button Barry's pants and um so my mom was like oh has he gained weight and so the nurse was like well this wasn't like this yesterday like his belly was really extended and um so my mom was just like we'll figure it out later um they put him they just covered the shirt uh covered his pants with a shirt and like it ha i didn't know it was unbuttoned the whole time um so this was in the end of january um and so at first they were trying to figure out what was going on like did he have like the stomach bug or something like that um and i still didn't know anything was going on and then i think I'm trying, I don't think I knew anything until, so February 20th is my birthday, and I went, got through my birthday, had tons of fun, and then the next morning at like 8 a.m., Brooke calls me, and she says, we need to go to Seven Hills, and I said, oh, did Barry have a seizure, and she said, no, and so I was pretty confused, she's just like, get dressed, and we'll go. And so I did, and um, I was admittedly a little bit hungover, so very confused as to why I was being woken up at 8 a.m. about if Barry didn't have a seizure, like, why do we need to go see him? Um, so we got in the car, and she seems pretty sad, and I'm pretty confused as to why. Like, like I said, I didn't know anything was going on, and so I was like, what is going on? She was like, I'm not exactly sure. Let's just go see him. And so when we got there, he was just very sleepy and not really too responsive. And, and so this was the beginning of the end, like I've already talked about. And um, like when I saw him, I just didn't understand why everyone was so concerned. Like, so what? He was sleepy. Like that, that wasn't too out of the normal for him just to have like a sleepy day. Um, and so at this time, this was when um, – the feeds started to switch to like Pedialyte. And I, and that wasn't completely abnormal either because if he was sick, that that, that would happen a lot to give him nutrition, but um, then like electrolytes, but not to overload his stomach. And so I figured that there would be the switch back to the formula at some point. And um, unbeknownst to me, it had already been decided that there would be no switch back. Um, and so I was so confused, like all of this was going on, but nobody was telling me anything. And so like my mom wasn't there that day. So Brooke and I, when we were with Barry, we called her and like trying to get the full story. And so my mom said that um, she didn't want to tell me anything because she wanted me to have a fun birthday. It was my first one in college. And she wanted me to try to have a little bit of a normal time because that was soon going to come to an end. And I, and I, I couldn't understand that. And she was saying that this was the end. And 
in my mind, I really always thought that two things, one of two things would take Barry, that he would either have a seizure and just not be able to breathe because he would drop his oxygen when he would seize, um, and that would take him, or in some sort of emergency surgery, like something would go wrong. Um, it, like I was expecting a kind of a big episode sort of thing. So for him just to be sleepy, like that didn't really make sense. Um, and so I was like, he just has the flu, I bet. Like what, like what, what, what have you done so far? And thinking that nothing really had been done. And I was wrong though, because they had already run all kinds of testing. So I think they had done some x-rays too of his stomach. Um, and they couldn't find anything like acutely wrong. So Dr. Hauer um, interpreted this to mean that his body was shutting down. And um, like I said, I didn't know this, but I guess it's pretty typical in kids like Barry that that's more typical ending, just like slowly, like one organ system by the next um, just kind of shuts, shuts off. And so on the day of his Make-A-Wish when his belly was so descended, that was his um, like GI tract shutting down. And so there were all these signs that I had missed, but also it was kind of like purposefully hiding from me. So it was this interesting balance because I think that, they did, that nobody wanted to tell me that these things were happening because they knew that there was no way to make him better, and they knew that I would not want, accept that, that there was nothing to do, um, and that I would just kind of turn over, turn into let's figure out a solution mode and like not just spend the time with Barry that I needed to. So I think that that's why I wasn't told all of the facts at first, but then of course when I found out I was not getting the full truth, I was upset. Um, but now that I look back on it, I think that that was a good thing because I do I'm so happy that I just went there and just spent the time with him and wasn't worried, wasn't worrying about um, like wasting time that could potentially save him or figure out a treatment like that kind of thing. Um, so yes, so when I found out the feeds were being shut off, I was definitely upset. And um, it was like a realization that it was the end. And looking back on it now, I think that it was the right step. I think he would have gone even sooner if they hadn't shut them off yet. Um, I think that, that they made all the right choices. And I honestly don't know if I could have made them yet because while I made that difficult choice with the oxygen at the end, it was so much worse by that point that I knew there was no end. And so I think that um, if, if they had told me that they had trapped the feeds, I wouldn't have been able to realize yet that it was the real end and I would have fought tooth and nail to get that feed turned back on. Wow. You're, it's extraordinary the extent to which you have come to really understand um, and, and rationalize with total clarity and eyes wide open and acceptance how everything went like the 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 narrative and the the three miracles and three miracle days it, it's just beautiful because, because honestly i can see lexi i can see how you talk about it and what you say and how you say it that it's oh you really feel like it's oh like how it all is and how it was is all not only okay, but it was you gave Barry had a beautiful life, and it was. Do do you like when you talk about it? When you tell people about your brother and the arc of his life, I like to think of it as an arc. Like, what words would you use to describe his life? Well, I think it's interesting because I think the reason I've gotten to this point of being able to have this this view that his life was okay, like he had a good life and. Um, every all the events that transpired were the right choices and we we had so many beautiful moments that I'm so thankful for is because I talk about it so much so I actually give like a yearly talk um, at a leadership academy about Barry and it's kind of like um, on the frame point that like somebody always has it worse than you and to be appreciative of what you have um, and 
the first time I wrote, I wrote the speech, I, that was, that was probably the first time I kind of sat down and thought about his life from start to end. Um, because before that it would just kind of be like chunks, like, before he passed away, I would kind of just talk about who Barry was as a person. Like, yes, I would mention that he was disabled severely, but I would never go into detail about like all the horrible things that had happened. Um, unless it was like happening right then. Like if he was in, if we were in crisis mode, as we would say, and something was going wrong and we kind of had to like alert the family. Um, but I, I like to focus on his abilities rather than his disabilities. So I didn't, I didn't like to, um, talk about the his hard times as much um and then after he passed away I think first of all more people say like more people want to know like when when they just meet me like why he passed away kind of thing so then I kind of have to explain more like well uh, his his disability and then also I have to explain who he was as a person because that person never got the chance to meet him and also um how did you get in? The, my dog just came in. <laughs> the door I saw the door open. <laughs> you think you want to pick him up? We can see your dog. <laughs> oh my goodness, you got a bad haircut, pup. <laughs> it's so it's right. Say a hello. dog that Barry did not like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> okay, now you have to go back downstairs. Mom, can you call the dog? I don't know how she opened that door. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so when people want to know about Barry now, who I have just recently met, I have to tell them, like, about his disability more because obviously they don't understand why a 16-year-old boy passed away. But I've also come to realize this weird thing that happens when I say I lost my 16-year-old brother. First, there's a big gasp, like, oh my God, that's a, such a tragedy. tragedy. And, then they're, and then when they say, well, what happened? And I say, well, he was severely disabled. There's kind of like this, oh, like he was just supposed to die. Like that was just normal because of these problems he faced. So even though now when I talk about Barry, I have to explain his disability more, um, I still try to really focus on who he was as a person. So when people say that, oh, they kind of understand that he was more than just a disability and more than just a sick kid. Um, and so, like, the the writing of the talk and giving the talk every year is very therapeutic. And I, the first year when I gave it, I, I was so nervous that I was so scripted, and I really didn't want to cry in front of these people, um, and I didn't. And I remember after the talk, um, one of the students, or I think it was actually a staff member, um, she said to me, I can't believe you didn't cry. I was bawling my eyes out. And that moment made me realize, like, grief is so weird. Like, there's some days I can talk about Barry for hours and, and look at his pictures and not shed a tear. Like, it will just be in, in happy. And then there are other days where just a little thing could set me off, like, just, like, hearing the song that we used to sing together the most that would just tear me up, you know? And I don't really know exactly why. I think, like, um, it's weird every year when it approaches um, his his death anniversary. Like, I at first I don't notice it, but I start to go through this weird, like, change. Like, I think right after my birthday, it, it starts. So I don't – I never recognize it at first. I mean, it's only been three years, but – um. I start to kind of I get really quiet and definitely like more sensitive. And I realize this because I live with five girls and um, I usually get into some sort of little tiff with one of them. And I don't realize it until they like one of them brings it up. Like, I know it's a tough time of year for you. And then it's kind of like, right. Like I know in my mind that the date is approaching, but this, like I go through this like emotional state where it's like, like, it takes a toll on me, like, unconsciously. Yeah. So I think all in all, given all of these facts together, um, when I go to describe Barry, I talk the most about probably his first, like, 12 years of life. Um, they were definitely the happiest for him. They were definitely the time when we had the most pictures of 
him when we can just say, wow, he was so cute. Um, as a little toddler, like playing in the pool where was his favorite activity. So any pictures of the pool we have just remind us of his true joy. And um, that's what I want people to know about my brother. I want, I want them to understand that just because he couldn't talk, like me and him could play as kids. Me and him could have conversations like without talking and we could both be of comfort to each other and um he was just the happiest boy like the, all these things were wrong in his life so i right now i'm working at um a sober house for recovering addicts and um our group therapy session that i was running was about being grateful and when i first started this internship i think i had a negative opinion toward addicts because i thought to myself Barry never asked for these troubles he faced and um, like these people get themselves into situations and now like need help. And like, it was, it was a weird imbalance to me. Like, um, but especially I, I had already changed, started to change my thinking, but this conversation in particular um, really made me realize that like his situation wasn't that different. Like, I think that these like, all of them went through these horrible stories. They told me of, of why they're grateful and then what they're grateful for. And then at the end, one of the gentlemen said, what are you grateful for? And I said, you know, it's funny because I actually am grateful for a lot of the same things as you guys. A lot of them said, I'm grateful just to be alive. Um, there, I, there have been times when I shouldn't have been alive. And I said, you know, I'm really grateful to be alive as well. Um, I saw, oh, I actually attended a church service while I was on a service trip in Alabama and I'm not a religious person and I'm not Baptist, but it was at a Baptist church. It was kind of like a field trip sort of thing. Um, and the pastor said something like, um, like just be grateful that you can just breathe. And like, and these ideas just like help me realize that like, my life, like I have so many gifts and abilities and also I can just breathe and not have to worry about being able to just breathe like Barry did. And um, I think that the fact that a 16 year old boy who couldn't talk, who couldn't walk, could teach me this at such a young age um, is, is something I can't even really describe, like how amazing that is. Um, I feel sorry for people who never got to meet him. Um, I'm sad that my future family will never meet him. I really wish they could. Um, and my oldest nephew actually did meet him like as an infant. Not that he has any memory of spending time with him, but um, it's funny because when I show him pictures of Barry, like especially when he was little, he says, is that me? Which I think is so beautiful and innocent because um, like a lot of, once kids get a little bit older, he's only three, usually they see pictures of Barry and say, what's wrong with him? But like William, my nephew, he just sees just a little boy. And um, we have given William Barry stuffed animals. And I, my sister was just telling me a story about how um, William went through this phase where he wanted to give things back to people who had given things to him. So he was holding his lovey lion from Uncle Barry and he said, I need to give this back to Uncle Barry. And my sister Kristen says, oh, no, no, he gave it to you as a gift. He wanted you to have it. And so William said, well, when can I see Uncle Barry? And, you know, to, how do you explain this situation at all before even the death aspect to a three-year-old? You really can't. But I think that um, just through just through his story, like I want her, Kristen's kids and my future kids and Brooke's future kids to know that they had this amazing relative like they should be honored to be connected to Barry in some way and even though they didn't get to meet him he's still their uncle Barry and uh, I think the, maybe they'll even still feel his presence sometimes I know I do like like I said I'm not a religious or spiritual person but sometimes these things happen when I really don't have an explanation for them like, um, I'll be on my way to an important interview or something and drinking class by Lee Bryce, the first song he sang to us will come on. And I, I just interpret it as kind of like, I'm here for you. You're going to do great. Like, um, you're going to, you're going to find them. He's, he's going to be at your white yeah. coat ceremony. He is yeah. gonna be at your white coat mm -hmm. ceremony. There will be some giant yeah. sign that he yeah. is there. 
That is, I, that is true. Yeah. So there are a lot of these situations, um, like, like now, like I just described and even during Barry's care where I had these like internal conflicts between my heart and my brain because I'm a very scientific person and I think of everything in terms of science and when I would have to make decisions about Barry or at least just to form an opinion, like I never really used my science as much. And that was so unusual for me. Like it's just that I wanted Barry to be okay. I just wanted to do whatever would help him survive. And then now when I like think about any other case, that's not my brother. I think of all the science and I just remind myself, like, I think that going to medical school and becoming a doctor, like, I will um, have this advantage that not many other of my classmates will have because while I can still function as a doctor and use that science to give my best advice to their family members, I will still remember that they, what they are going through. And um, I know that they probably won't be able to think with their brains as much um, like I couldn't either. And um, like it, it helps me remember that, um, unfortunately, as my sisters like to remind me, like science can't explain everything. And um, science definitely can't explain those situations where I see my brother now, um, where I feel him with me. And um, I, don't, I don't know if science yet can even explain what truly happened to Barry. And I think that it's a little bit of my life's mission kind of to figure it out for myself. Um, I know that there are a lot of other kids out there like Barry who don't have an answer of what, what went wrong or why his body just failed him so many times. And um, I told him um, before he left that I, pr I promised him that um, I would figure it out. I know it wouldn't help him. And um but it could help someone else. And I think that um, while he's left a legacy for me, I think that if I could make his legacy even bigger in finding out answers for other people and getting his story out there, then I think that maybe I would repay him just a little bit um, for all the things he did for me and gave me. So that is my life's mission to um, fulfill that promise and figure out what happened to him and help the other kids like him.